Right, so thanks for coming. Um, my name is Nicole Sansone. I'm a PhD researcher at Goldsmiths. And I just want to say a few things to set up the panel before we get started. Um, so our panel today, I brought them together because I wanted to bring some answers to the question of um, how and why it is that love of art or a passion for working in the arts is a prerequisite to working in the arts. So, in one respect, love or passion for what you do is not by any means exclusive to um, job hunting in the arts or the creative sector. This is the, a, per a pervasive dynamic in all neoliberal systems, right? So they, the market demands this sort of singular passion and focus and devotion to your labor, but then in exchange offers very little for that, um, for that passion. So you have minimal job security, you have below living wages, you have X, Y, and Z. So repeatedly we see how these kinds of, um, how job markets in neoliberal systems are everywhere beset by these double standards. But I thought there was maybe a peculiar way that this double standard operated in the art world because the whole operation runs so much on potent positive affects. So we make really we make goodwill deals with handshakes. We um, offer popularity at the expense of wages, and all of this is around an object that sometimes never actually even leaves the body. So it's, it never goes outside of your mind, or it's an artwork that's, that lives inside of a body, or it's an artwork that might be a sculpture or a painting, but really it's a kind of extension of the surface volume of your body. And that seemed to me to be an added layer of intense intimacy, like an intense interiority that was being picked and cried at when a neoliberal art market demands that we labor for love of art. So this is what I wanted our panelists to think about. Both Mike and Gitanjali are concerned with the specific machinations of bodies in specific contexts. And I thought their combined voices could maybe not answer the question of this peculiar condition of the art world, but instead add more complexity to the issue. So they might come, I wanted them to come here and present their work to us and to each other. And in the process of doing this, it would inject more information into the equation. So more ways to think about bodies and the environments they move through and their ambient logics. Um, and then and perhaps as a result, we might here in the room arrive at some conclusions at how we as actors in this art world can then negotiate or renegotiate the borders and boundaries of the art world, starting from within our own bodies and at radiating outward into all the other, to impact the other bodies that we interact with on a daily basis. Right, so, with that in mind, our first panelist for today is Katanjali Pindya. She's a London-based Mauritian writer and doctoral researcher in cultural studies at Goldsmiths. Her present research looks at decoloniality and creative practices such as music in the Creole mother tongue. Gitanjali currently lectures at the School of Media and Performing Arts, Middlesex University, and she's also engaged with creative writing. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so first, uh, thank you very much, Nicole, for, for curating this magnificent event and for inviting me and my chat to, to hopefully answer some questions, but I think I have more questions than answers, <laughs> but yeah. So, um, yeah, I'd like to say that uh, when I looked at, the, at your curatorial project, there was two aspects that I found uh, extremely inspiring and also which will interweave with my talk uh, today. So first, uh, it's poetic aspect, which made me reflect on how do we think about uh, art outside its contemporary economic dimension, beyond its historical, temporal and geographical dimension, and also especially in relation to post-colonial spaces, beyond the inherited formalist tradition of art history, which is what part of my research lived into. Uh, within those spaces where a dominant aesthetic uh, around visuality becomes the norm through coercive colonial strategies of erasure and in our contemporary lives through inherited structures of power and knowledge which are as much spectral in forms as tangible within the geographies we continue to inhabit. The second aspect of the project which I was impelled to look into was what you describe as the social ecology of contemporary art. While the word ecology has become quite a buzzword sometimes, it informs the primordial relationship, uh, 
relational dynamics of how living organisms interact, cohabit, depend, and also use and abuse other forms of life to exist and coexist. For me, this relationship remains important in the context of exploitation and accumulation, which defines the last 500 years of colonialism and coloniality, which are the residues of colonization. <coughs> This relationship is also human in the sense that the colonized bodies, mutilated, violated, erased, and silenced, refuse to die in the figurative sense of the word. It is at this junction of an imposed violent silence that I look at the sonic body. A body which vibrates and resonates at a frequency of sound that we cannot hear. So much nice sound. Yeah. It's also part of what the kind of sort of relationship. Uh, I will focus my talk on two aspects of my research practice. What I call autopoiesis, the, ab the ability to autocreate, to self-create in ecologies of oppression. And second aspect is the sonic body, which stays alive through literally waves of vibration in the blood. What one of the theorists that I look into, Harry Cooper, explains as noises in the blood. Despite the silencing voice through the erasure of history, culture, and language, which I also look into. Within the global post-colonial space that we all inhabit, the decolonial space of creation, of art for life, or living for art, are essential spaces where who enters, who produces knowledges, who speaks, and who are objects and who are subjects allow for configurations of power to be dismantled or at least questioned. In, uh, in my research on the postcolonial geography of mainland Mauritius in the Indian Ocean, I look at how artists negotiate and disrupt these often very conservative spaces. Conservative in the sense that certain models of aesthetics and knowledges became, become fixated paradigms within settler communities, but also within global art networks, biennales, art fairs, which are global, but uh, which still uh, need to be disrupted at many levels, as you can see, different biennales. While resistance and aesthetics of contestation are common narratorial genre found in contemporary art, music or literature, which I look into, I became obsessed by the idea of spaces of creative life practices in resistance. So how it is important as part of living to actually resist through art or through other forms of uh, expression. Um, one of the elements that I observed in post-colonial contemporary art and literature is the use of mother tongue. Languages, languages which had witnessed erasures through, through the imposition of colonial languages. So uh, what I observe in the uh, artworks that I actually uh, analyze for my research are how they use it in visual text, through the work, in the titles of the work, uh, in poetic pieces, as part of the artwork, or literary pieces in the author's mother tongue. <coughs> Through their works, I was compelled to start thinking in Creole, which is also my mother tongue, and a language in its varieties spoken by a few million people across the Caribbean and the Indian Ocean. Yet made into a taboo language within those specific spaces under a colonial epistemology. So while artistic creativity was framed through established canons, the resistance of these artists to break epistemology with aesthetics, that means break knowledge with art, allowed me to rethink what creative practices and things. It was through their practice that I could look at art outside its formalist tradition uh, and understand the inherent purpose of language here. Not as language per se, but the human as a languaging storytelling what philosopher Sylvia Winter calls an autopoetic languaging living system. A knowledge system which purports a cosmogony where the origin stories we tell the world 
transgress our present order of knowledge. What art history reveals all the way and what winter calls the third event. First being the origin of the, uni of the universe, second the explosion of all forms of biological life, and third the human as what she calls homo narans. The human as a hybrid auto instituting languaging storytelling species. In my context of research, language determined my line of thinking. Language not seen within a linguistic, written, or literary perspective, but language, the sonic, the performative, and the embodied aspect of language. Thinking through sound, as Julian Henry Gate puts it. So, autopoesis and sonic cultures, which is the title of my talk, stems from looking first at the use of the Creole language as a political statement in contemporary art, which in the context of Mauritius is predominantly about what Stuart Hall calls white aesthetics in the post-colonial post space. And then secondly, through not looking at language, but hearing and living it. It was at that point that I stopped looking at language, but started listening to this languaging living system and the bodies who spoke the language. So in that perspective, I'm going to read a poetic piece that I write in my language. So here, it, it, it don't, it, it's, no point, it's not necessary to understand it. It's a poetic piece that I wrote when my niece, Kaya, was born. Kaya is named after a Mauritian Sege artist who was brutalized and killed under police uh, brutality in 1999. So my sister decided to call her daughter Kaya. So it's so here it is. So dis mon mari toi, mon embrasse toi, mon guette toi bien, ti Frida Kaya. Ti 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 ti, pas même une gaille en moi, depuis de vie c'est pas toi et de maman. Kaya, loin là-bas dans Berlin, te une décide prend nom Kaya. Toi, en diaspora, te fin décide amen en bout de Maurice à toi. Kaya, oui Kaya. Sa même Kaya qui te sent femme dans l'île qui porte tout pour lui. Kaya qui te donne des respirs à la fille et qui donne l'espoir de tout. Kaya, un victime, un système qui amène la paix par la violence tout. Kaya, victime, un système qui servit au pouvoir au contrôle de tout. Toi, tu te frida Kaya. Bogue toi, faire Kaya Kaya. Loin là-bas, tu as envie de battre toi. Zodi, je vais te ton maman, Frida Kaya, ton maman qui peut aller avec toi, qui peut écrire à papier conférence, qui peut préparer à poser dans le Congo là-bas. Ton maman me sert, une femme dans l'île, qui reste dans l'île, qui ne reste pas dans l'île, qui embrasse ce diaspora. Ton maman Kaya, pour lire le monde entier, elle n'est pas toi. Self-imposition of a sonic landscape. When I speak in my language, I feel that my body becomes more visible, more audible, more present. Yet, my presence is a sound which is unfamiliar and which echoes in the absence of similar voices in the room. The echo and reverberation are what Henrique explains in the context of Jamaican sound systems music studio production methods of elongating the auditory life of a sound. The echo also brings me to winter's third event of the first echo of the storytelling human. Uh, there's another book by Louis Chude Soke, uh, which I haven't read yet, but he calls the echo of the original sound of the Big Bang a mere propagation of sound waves in the infinite space-time of the universe. The notion of echo as both, as both sonic reverber reverberation and elongated life of sound allowed me to rethink language and its effect and affect on the body and on the space that it infiltrates. Similar to the sound system, which Anipo explains at low frequency permeates the body through waves and vibrations 
and where the loudspeakers position at three angles in a triangular shape create what both a donut of sonic waves. The Creole language for me embody a similar resonance in the sense that the Creole language was created by the first uh, Africans who moved out of uh, Af uh, Africa under slavery within the new lands and where they were, they created a new language. So in that sense, it's probably one of the sort of um, new West contemporary languages that, uh, that we have. So it was a moment of self-creation, of autopoiesis. So autopoiesis, autocreation, self-creation, a language oral in nature, a creole generated in the colonies where hundreds of their own African tongues were cut off. To take Gloria and Zaldua's visceral terminology. Where a scarred colonial landscape of exploitation was rehumanized by the creative sound of language, but also the vibrations that this new language brought to the bodies through music and dance in the language. So I look in, at the Rootsical Sega, which is a polymorphous performative art form consisting of dance music, storytelling, and song in the language. And which is now the national uh, music and dance. Through this, it was possible to see how the Creole culture was predominantly born as a sonic culture. So how do you look at a culture within uh, within the literary or formalist tradition, a culture which is basically a sonic culture. So this is also part of my practice is to look at the methodology to, to, to read and write about this practice. So depending on the range of rhythm in the various form of the performance, from trance-like slow music with focus on the vocalist, to very rhythmic beats, it is accompanied by a specific dance movement in which the upper body, especially the thighs, are stirred vigorously while the feet are grounded in slower motions, bringing both artists and audience into a participatory and visceral sonic and visual experience. Unlike the commercial Sega that you have today, where the audience is a spectator in the same way as the colonial beast functions, the Sega, the performance, has what Gilroy articulates as the epistemologies of call and response, which describes the antiphony effect characteristic of African musical legacies in which the audience responds to a leading voice at systemic intervals. While in the sound system culture, sonic bodies are vocal as well as musical, in a similar way, in the Sega, it's called the Chul, the rhythmic cry of the singer, usually male, who is also dancing, to increase the tempo of the dance, elicit the response of the other dancers to increase the rhythm of their movements. For Enrique, sonic bodies are performative and highly skilled and are therefore knowing knowledgeable and they make sense between two. They, they bring sense, they make sense. Unlike listening to the Sega or on looking the practice as a curious spectator which puts the body outside sound, the Sega dancers have their bodies placed inside sound. Uh, a, a small quote from Enrique which I found quite uh, inspiring. Sonic bodies have to be heard, felt, and given the attention of listening. It is of little use looking at them. Sonic bodies demand being approached in a certain way, one based on a relationship of mutual recognition and respect, as distinct from the positivist scientific paradigm of prediction and control. Sonic bodies produce, experience, and make sense of sound. Sound, even as the playing of a recording is always live, at the point of hearing. Sounding has to be embodied as an event in a particular time and space, as distinct from being frozen as a text or image whose embodiment is less immediate. For Caroline Cooper, who in relation to the Jamaican dance hall, 
observes the sonic body as a resistant container of what life throws at it. She speaks of dance as a mode of theatrical self-disclosure in which the body speaks eloquently of its capacity to endure and transcend material deprivation. The woman dancer in particular, whose body responds to the vibrating beat of the Sega music and becomes one with the sound. The body that loses the, the rational capacity to adhere to conservative social norms and etiquette of the respectable body. In other words, the knowing body and not the body of knowledge takes over. Through, lo through looking at the sonic performance of language and dances who embody the language, I read the Sega as an everyday creative practice of resistance to coloniality, hence act as a performative or haptic historiography, but it, also, it is also a form of autopoiesis, self-creation, which are processes of regeneration and rehumanization. Winter theorizes about the creative, epistemic, and aesthetic movement of creative practices under repression of a new language, in my case, as a process of rehumanization, being or becoming human. For winter, the human is not a word like the human Renaissance men, but a verb. Verb as alterable, as relational. The only way to rehumanize an ecology of exploitation of colonial landscapes was to develop the possibility to auto-create for oneself spaces of creative resistance and sustenance. The Sega represents a creative practice which took shape under a suppressed regime for, for where those enslaved who experienced themselves as being human and dehumanized could create their own autopoiesis. Autopoiesis is a process of self-creation which implies the practice of creating possibilities of life and culture under dominant regime. Winter calls it first aesthetic creative practices. We should move beyond our present human sciences to that of a new science of human forms of life and their correlated modes of yesterday, making visible the way authors and artists auto institute everyday embodied practices of self creation, which in our contemporary context can rehumanize the time. So I finish here by asking a few questions, uh, like I was saying, Nicole, not, me, not, not having really answers, but how do we reposition the being human at the center of art? Is there a way of humanizing or rehumanizing aesthetics? How do we reanimate and fully realize the co-relational poetics, poetics aesthetics of our rational selves? Questions that continue guide my line of thought. Thank you. So, yeah, thanks for that. So our next speaker is Mike Vandrip. She studied philosophy, science, and technology studies and choreography in Amsterdam, London, Maastricht, and Berlin. And she's currently a doctoral researcher and associate lecturer at the Center for Cultural Studies in Goldsmiths. She's working on non-normative ethics as a conceptualization of trans, and alongside philosophy, is engaged with making films. Sorry. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nicole, and thank you, Anthony, also. And thank you all for coming. Uh, as a philosopher, I have a tendency to write quite abstract, because that's what I do. I make concepts, and concepts are then used uh, I think my work is in, in a way quite close to Anjali, so once you ever get lost and think like, what the hell are you talking about? I'm also actually talking about those bodies, but I hide it. <laughs> <laughs> right, so my paper is called um, Unlovable Souls, the Craft and the Broken Structure of the World. In this panel, for the love of art, I will talk about the art and craft of love. It is easy to pretend when you have a body that fits. To pretend love when you have a body that fits. But it's harder, much harder, to craft love when you have a soul that has wandered off. I am not talking about masculine distractedness when it comes to the life of others. 
But I will be talking about souls that have distracted themselves out of the normative demands and the available modes of relationality. While in affluent heteronormativity, encountering the unknown in openness and not as imposition is perhaps only in the beginning moment of romantic love. Outside of these spheres, the unknown might be a more regular occurrence for lack of control and the need to leave normative orderings behind. Aristotle explains logos as the formation of the soul of the ensouled body, the summary of experience, way to perceive, and acts culminating in practical truth. When the logos of a soul has moved on, away from what is ordinarily knowable, to make an unordinary relation is what is commonly called witchcraft, the craft of relating to the unknown. Soma Technics teaches that bodies and forms of relations are intimately connected. The bodies of knowledge, bodies politic, and somatic relations are intimately entangled. In this bodily being in the world, forms of life find their linkage to possible and impossible patterns of life, friction, and codified behaviors. These possible and impossible, uh, oop, these relations, <laughs> Paragraph, <laughs> reading glasses, age. <laughs> um, these, rela <laughs> um, these relations are structures as variables around a single axis of dominance and exclusion. Sylvia Winter has argued the colonial project served to bring the world into a single field of power governed by a master code. This master code generally exalts white, straight masculinity and hierarchically devalues those that do not fit this apex. These codings serve to distribute benefits upwards and exploitation downwards. This is why it's a hierarchy. Since the overturn of direct colonialism, both in the global south as well as in the various civil rights struggles, different attempts at changing this master code can be discerned. While these struggles have been, on the one hand, successful, they have certainly not been able to completely overturn the governing order of science and racism, sexism, and various other hierarchical audience orderings can readily be seen to have found new articulations and contemporary patternings. These orderings of access, knowledge, distribution of emotional and economic labor, incarceration, space to speak, be, live and die, thrive and whittle, are attached to bodies and can thus be summarized as the master code. Friedrich Kittler articulates code as a commanding line which is deficient if the input is smaller than the output. Bodily codings fulfill this function as they are attached to visibility and governing orders can immediately check can be immediately checked and are readily and pervasively present in any political ordering. This ordering is impacting the formation of logos and soul bodily beings, as structures that need to be navigated, defended against, or pretended to be called to. However, while certain orderings might be clear in their hierarchization, when these orderings get challenged and confronted, things get muddled not only in a, resist, uh, in a situation of resistance, as the backlash, the friction of change, but also in the relational side. Here, come, here, we come one of the, here we come to one of the deciding moments of radical change. In absence of patterns of relation, um, a swap in persons or groups occupying structures can often be discerned, but the patterns remain in place at first. Think, for instance, about the Russian Revolution, or the French, uh, French Revolution, or the heteronormative, who wears the trousers of the relationship, right? Uh, these are immediate swaps, uh, while the patterns, remain, the patterns of power remain structural. While this problem is reasonably well known, the problem I will be looking at today is the formation of new patterns of relation. Because while it is admittedly the case that dominant, uh, while it is admittedly the case that dominant relationality is aimed at exploitation, it might also be the case that a lot of people are willing to forego that expo exploitation and find new ways of relation, uh, even if that means a different division of work. 
I know this is optimistic, but I think this is also true. Uh, at the same time, it must be discerned that the current structures of relation and power do not leave much possibility to engage without exploitation. This then means that the world as we know it has to end. Always hard. <laughs> we'll always come to that. Uh, the collapse of the current order of codes and relations can in part be achieved by modifying the relations that we have. Note, Ibrahim Kendi makes a clear point that it's not love, but the retraction of self-interest that will propel change, uh, which affects those that are not close as well. So there's always like love overcome hate. I, I think it is absolute bollocks. Um, well, the retraction of self-interest also touches these people that are further away from you because self-interest is a structure of exploitation, yeah? Here I will return to the discussion on bodies. Egalité or equality discourses will make the case that it is not a specific body that makes inequality. Uh, as hierarchical coding claim, but structures can be found that enable bodies to relate in equal ways. This is classic libertarian liberal theory, right? In a sense, egality discourses make the case that structures can be detached from the people that operate within them and all will come well. The belief here is that the structure can be so powerful that individual agents will not able to undo the justice built into the whole. Uh, however, what can be discerned is that minoritized agents are not able to undo the injustice built into the whole. A structure that claims equality while producing inequality lets people that flow to the top off from facing that they have met structural support. This is why at the top of the hierarchy it is so exalting to claim equality because when both, one can both claim innocence as well as a sense of achievement. The same claim to equality at the lower part of the structure is either hope that one might make it up uh, or else demand that things, things change. The techne, the mode of relation, works as propellers, pushing certain agents in one direction and others in another. This is this master code again. Um, Derrida explains the difference between logos attached to bodies and logics attached to commodities. In patterns of relation that are all but set, bodies are reduced to their commodifying properties in order to function according to social codings leading to social distribution of labor, wealth, health, affects, intensities, boredom, and death. This means that the social technique of relation works as a structure within a structure uh, that already disinvests in bodies, and the double alienation functions to smoothen the process of distribution. Sometimes this is in contradiction. The overarching structure claims equality, while the distributive relations organize inequality. Sometimes these work in tandem, as when the logos, the practical knowledge of the agent, cannot be heard, understood without effort, or listened to within the macro and meso structures of relation. How then can love, the micro answer ruled through meso and macro patterns, be the answer? Love doesn't trump hate, as hate is impersonal and structural, as it is based on the commodification of relations. Sarah Ahmed explains that heteronormative love and at times queer antics too are also based on patterns that are available and thus already structured in organizing and distributing labor and effects. Love and hate are general, impersonal distributions of relation, neither of which are generally supportive of liberation. But what happens when our bodies emerge in a meeting that aims to go beyond familiar structures, either when refusing the distribution, or else when we meet and do not know how to relate, or decide we change the way of relations? Our bodies are geared to respond to situations according to codings attached and respond to the codes of others. We are commodified. Escaping this commodification is often done by retraction in spaces organized through patterns of sufficient homogeneity, the so-called safe spaces, and addresses relations, these relations in as well as outside of these spaces. Here, the escape from the SOMA techniques, the order of relations attached to bodies, needs to make way for a process of trans-SOMA techniques the changing of order and making space for emerging patterns of relation. 
to flag here already, there need not be an end, neither clear or an utopian, as transformer technical reworkings can continually can continue to perpetually take place. However, it is also important to see that it is not just a space making from the body, but through the body, as codings need to be unlearned and disordered and newly found. In this last statement, the issue arises that while it is easy to claim the newness combustible, combusting upon the block, this neither explains what goes on nor helps in emerging ethics from finding footholds. Derrida harks back to Socrates and finds there already that writing detaches arguments from the body. Socrates makes the case that argumentation is always personal, positional and interrelational, according to Derrida's reading. In Socrates, we find the case against commodification quite clearly articulated as the logos of the agent, and here I depart from Derrida, is intimately related to the world as it is acted in. In practical matters, it is this logos that informs the truth of the world. And it is Aristotle who makes this case quite clearly. However, the, pro the problem with Aristotle is, of course, that his philosophy is based on getting people to fit into the structure that is based on exploitation, that the opponents, um, with its misogyny and slavery. While it is more helpful for the pursuit of this argument to see how this logos can function to leave the police behind. Here we are back to finding new patterns of relation and changing the technique that forms the structure, the technique of the crafts of relation that we have. Uh, this means that new techniques need to be found that are emerging from a practical truth that needs to found its grounding, that needs to find its grounding in changing relations. The craft of relating to the unknown, to the changing body that comes with a different truth, is known in European history as witchcraft. But it has gone by other names in other places. The making of the unknown is to face loss in practical truth and loss in relation, because there is always room at the bottom. Willingness to face loss is the offer of the body to be changed and to form a new way of being. Loss is the gift without return. Loss then makes it possible to face the unknown, the unknowable and the new. Loss needs to structure this unfolding as otherwise it becomes an imposition leading to exploitation and the grafting the emerging possibilities as new forms serving the structure of power and distribution. So that means that not all kind of new is good new, right? Some kind of new is just new form of exploitation according to existing structures. So you have to be willing to give up things. Or as Alexander Behelaya, for instance, argued, some peoples have already given up so much that they are already ready to immediately come with new forms of relation. Um, this transformer techniques cannot lead to loss lo uh, this transformer techniques can lead to loss that culminates in brokenness if the change of relation is not mutual, as is so often the case with transness. Naraha articulates this most clearly when she suggests brokenness as the structural condition of trance. Brokenness is then the predicament of being unrelatable and being left alone, to be unlovable. There is no place, and the opened category leads to falling apart, creating new and different dreams, insights, and worlds. But these are rarely shared, and the whispers become wines. Wine, witch, and winning share a similar etymological root, Meichelen. <coughs> According to the Roman historian Tacitus, the early speakers of Germanic languages uh, quote, defined and foretold things to come by whinnying and neighing of their horses. We whinny and we whine, and all the, while, all the while we are calling the divine, and that is to lay a relation with the unknown. Whining might be calling the relation with the unknown, the unknown craft of relation, and the unknown relations that are still to come. The divine horse Pegasus was the call to relation, but the soft whinnying of Pegasus is not coming to take one away. The angel horse is currently drawing the sun chariot. And the lesson is always, the moment you are broken, no white horse will come to take you away. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help this. <laughs> um, white horses are busy working for the man. 
Right. It's a drawing sculpture area. Um, love is structured through power, and the offer of loss makes one disposable. Suddenly, Pegasus sound, the angel horse, is the lure of the promise of inclusion. But after the horse was stolen from Medusa, no witch has ever touched her. The angel horse is shot and broken in, used to slay a powerful feminine monster, the Chimera, right? Um, a soul changes when it's being stolen. Pegasus was a techne emerging from the froth and foam, the temporal spheres, used by Belaphoron to fight the Chimera. Pegasus was born from foam, and like Aphrodite, who was also born from foam, love, and has been included in the sun and lets no shine to make new ways of relating anymore. Romantic love is a heteronormative trap, submerging one into the form of life of another. Brokenness will not be healed by love. Brokenness finds itself as possibility towards the plenum in oneself, the indeterminate multiplicity of relation. This transubstantial, this changing of the body into a broken body that Denise Ferreira da Silva articulates is the possibility of changing bodies that give form to the emergence of new relations. Not in the universal capture of structure, alienation and commodification, but in a possible extension of new relations. Emerging techniques in a plenum enables a continued transformer techniques which never needs to stop and thus doesn't shot emerging angel horses to fight the chimeras over time. Only in this plenum, away from the singular ordering of man, can the offer of laws lead to new beginnings. In the polis, the universal capture of beings leads one to lose the possibility of change. But when one does and emerges in a relation of mutuality, brokenness ensures as the only possible start to the destruction of the world. To be whole here is to take from others, leaving the logic of exploitation as the truth of the soul. Offering the gift of loss, the offer without a return, is the first step to lay a relation with the unknown and the unknown relations of futures without exploitation. Thank you.
but in somewhere else. Yes, thanks. Um, this is actually also about this. Yeah, we can both answer this, I think. Um, so what I think, I, uh, I got trained in a conservative philosophy department, like a normal conservative, normal philosophy department, they're always conservative. Um, so I know that liberal theory, and I know also the, so liberal theory basically claims there's something like the state, this is also what I call here, this overarching structure that organizes, quote unquote, equality as they say, and then, oh, hey, <laughs> How awkward, it's always the same people that are the best at equality, you know, it's always the same people that are just slightly worse at equality or very much worse at equality. So the distribution in this um, um, pretends that there is a private and a public which doesn't exist already because I think a lot of bodies are uh, already invaded either by social workers, by the police, by uh, Medical, uh, medical science or invaded by lack of access. You know, that's also a form of invasion. So if you're uh, the meritocrat meritocrat, it's one of those words I can barely pronounce. Meritocracy? Uh, meritocrat No, I cannot do it. Uh, claim that you can grow into a structure, which is just false. You know, it is like, um, Oh, having been in academia and I came later in life to academia, um, it is a daily struggle to stay in there. And I think very much, uh, I think privileged people, you hear never articulating, oh, it's such a struggle to stay in academia. When minoritized people, you hear articulating on a daily basis how much effort it is to stay into that structure. So there is the private and public is already broken open. Now, I think what the amount of loss that I tried to Articulate here is in contrast to people like, uh, for instance, Koji Baitotti, we can say that one something revolution, but a revolution organized through Spinoza, also is always uh, generative and there's more and we get more happiness and more connection, um, which is what I distrust because that comes back to this old liberal theory that there's perpetual growth and process and that newness makes possible for moreness. And I think, coming right in from a trans perspective, uh, I know very well, I think, what it means to uh, lose something because you have less access, you become less audible overnight, sort of. Uh, and I think that's also what Alexander Wegelay argues so well through the book Habeas Fiscus, uh, how if your life has been stripped bare in this public, always a singular ordering, ordering of being, uh, then you can already find relations, what Dries Ferreira de Silva calls plenum, the, the, the many different forms of relations that are possible, and not only the single order of relations as the public space, which is always a singular public space, uh, asks you to be. Is that the answer? It's a bit scholarly. <laughs> Do you want to respond to this? Um, the idea of newness, I think this is a really interesting question. And I think uh, um, um, in many ways for me to, uh, yeah, it was interesting how for me to look for something new, I mean, which I think is something, a new method, a new way of looking, is actually looking way past, way in the past. So it's true, I think you mentioned as well the fact of new, um, the fact of it being uh, more progress, more and this, and more new things. I'm also used to this. Every day there's a new thing, you know. We don't have to talk about the iPhone phenomena right now. Mm. But yeah, it's true that looking for the. I think, yeah, it's not. I, it's not looking for the new. It's really looking at um, those those spaces of new creation every day, practically like you know, every day thinking, every day living. More than looking at something bigger, new. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I, I guess my question kind of piggybacks off that question. Um, but I found, I, first of all, I really love these papers. Uh, and I found that in these papers, um, you both talk quite a bit about practices of relating to the unknown as a kind of radical politics. 
or going outside of visual, the visual register <laughs> for uh, the Sonic, for instance. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, uh, I'm a bit pessimistic about this because I'm working on this as well. Like, don't modes of power or control also try to find new ways of relating to that kind of affective presence or relationship to the Sonic? Uh, so can you talk a little bit about, um, I guess, optimism and pessimism of these sorts of practices? Like, is there also a danger in thinking about uh, the unknown as a place to sort of throw yourself into. Uh, Do you want to uh, this, this is just one thing that's coming up. I'll just say it and then. Because the, the idea of the, yeah. you know, the idea of the unknown, I would say the idea of the unknown is already known by the knowing body. Right. You know, and it's, I think it's why we have so much emphasis on the body is because we actually listen to the body less. We actually, yeah, that's actually what I mean. Listen to the body less, you know. Listen to the body. Right. We look at the body. I mean, it's not only in visual art practices, but right. it's the way we, um, the, 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 yeah, the world, the global world we live in is so much visual. You know, right. I mean, we, uh, technology, etc. Whereas when, where I look at oral uh, cultures, which basically was oral for for millennia. So it's completely old in many ways. It goes back to this idea of newness. For me, it was founded something, I mean, the sonic term or the ecology term is very, very new, like I was saying, but it's actually by looking at something that you already know. But you just, um, uh, you, uh, it has to, you actually have to put it aside to look at something probably, um, you know, more progressive or more visual or more there or more new. So in that sense for me, uh, especially when I look, uh, my entrance in, in, in my research was through contemporary art. You know, I have a visual art background and for me the first thing that I found quite interesting is how those artists were using language, but language on the canvas. So language as title, language as literature, so I was reading it all the time. It only took me to listen to myself. I realized also I'm, reading, I'm, I'm writing and reading in English, right, which is not the language I am actually living in. So it took me a, a different, not to use the word new, but it took me a different mode of rethinking about how I could listen to this kind of person, how I could listen to this. And when I talk to the artist, it's free all the time, and I transcribe it in English. So, um, yeah, the idea of the unknown, I think a lot of things we already know, or we also have to look at what's already been there for, you know, for, for millennia or so. Uh, and of course, the fact that I look at post-colonial spaces, the fact that 500 years ago there was a lot of things that was normal but was did not need to be normalized. There was not one one streak of of of, of, uh, of, of knowledge or one streak of visuality or one streak of being. So in many ways, it becomes what you call sort of the global norm when we talk about. I mean, this is a different sort of communication discourse, with globalization, etc. But there's a kind of norm that seeps through spaces that were never, never, I mean, you know, that goes to, I, I look at colonial spaces, but the idea of norm, um, you're looking at that, so, yeah. Yeah, and I think that for me the unknown is not, um, not present. Because I think uh, if I talk about uh, transness or also sometimes queerness, you can, uh, you are already an unknown being, so like a lot of like, uh, uh, especially straight white women, the, their best compliments they have for me is that they don't see I'm trans. So just by me not being me, then wow, I mean, you know, but I can never be what I be. And even for yourself, you don't know what transness is sometimes, you know, it's just this negotiation and this navigation in this context where you keep finding, and that's why I talk about logos, and logos is in the body, and it is a practical truth, and a practical truth is, in my other work I write about indeterminate affirmation. So you do say no, no to two things, like because that's the Aristotelian structure of double negation. Uh, and then you do something which is sort of moving through there, Angel Doha also writes about this very strongly in her Constitution of a New Mythos. It's also moving in between two dominant cultures, but it can also be two dominant genders or two dominant paradigms of relating to each other, whether it's a heteronormative or 
uh, a sort of vaguely queer poly uh, where you know how the run that goes, you know, even though you have to get it in your body still, you can also move through some, somewhere between there and find new ways. So uh, these things are happening, but and that's why I get the uh, out brokenness I say. It, it's like we are here, but then there is no way of relating to you. This is literally what, why I write about it like that. But it's not only about transness, I think. It's also like uh, you get that with blackness as nothingness. It is also literally that same discussion. You find very strongly better than this for the uh, Silva. But also, uh, Fanon talks about this already. This is where Sylvia Winter gets it from, you know? Uh, this is going back literally to that moment of, and then Fanon comes in this moment of unknowability and unspeakability. It's the concerning violence chapter, of course, in the Wretched of the Earth, where it is explosion of violence to make a space. And then I think 90s queer theory, they want something new, but they don't want uh, to say something happens after that newness, so it is openness with nothingness. But I think where I move beyond uh, this not being is already attached to a logos, is already a body and a bodily being. I mean, I think this is where it then, then is, but it's very strongly informed by having been a dancer. It's just like always, first uh, <laughs> you write also about yeah. dance. So yeah. there we are. So newness is also already this body that generates itself. Because if you read really Aristotle and you see that the dynamics in the soul and soul bodies are not faculties like in an enlightenment reading, which are always passive, the world is coming at you and you sort of <coughs> sit linking it in, but um, you can read dynamics also as active modes of engagement and activity. So you're, you are always already in the world making, generating, and then it becomes the newness. Because if the structure doesn't change, the structure of exploitation remains the same, that's why this loss is totally important, uh, you just start to exploit that newness. And you see this in the whole cultural appropriation debate, you know, like how the, the black culture constantly gets roamed off uh, and brought back into white capitalism in order as a, a generation of, of new modes of relation, a new culture, new cool. You know, and that's why this loss is important to yeah. not impose, because otherwise it becomes exploitation immediately. There's no way to stop that. Yeah. I'd like to just add something. I look at it from the perspective of the uh, of the discipline. Uh, for instance, uh, initially when you start research, I mean, you start by history, right? So like Foucault says, there's always a sort of causality. So there's, a new, there's always in our art history, especially, you know, there's always like this happened and then nothing new. It's like this progressive uh, timeline. So at some point when I went through this and I'm like, okay, but what I'm looking at is really happened 300 years ago, but I can't situate it in that timeline. And it's something so, uh, uh, so uh, present uh, as an embodied practice because this language that was born 300 years ago actually uh, becomes the mother tongue of the whole of the population today on the island and who came from about, I think, 30 linguistic practices. So my ancestors spoke Telugu in the, all the Indian languages. But the language has an embodied presence that through the years, uh, it, it actually becomes something that's part of you. So I had to look at the language not through a, through a, uh, through a, through a chronological timeline that history writing uh, uh, that the discipline brings us. That's what Sylvia Winter talked about the human sciences, but we've got to move outside this to look at the science of the human. So in that sense, for me, again, it was the same. It was because the language doesn't only embody my, my everyday living, but also through dance. Because when the, the, uh, what got me reflecting throughout the years is why I get so passionate with, the, with this dance, not other. And I love, you know, and I have this uh, affinity with like Reiki, with all this island rhythm. So I could not look through this on my research because it's something sonic and body then uh, I really needed to sort of break away from the from the from the linear method to actually look at how it's a temporal, a historical. You know? So yeah. in that sense it's it and I think under this, this exploitative regime, the knowable is also always the categorizable. And I think the dance and the movement is already, and also trans body, is already moving out of that, you know, by its bodily being, because it does not need to be structured in text. Yeah, it cannot be. Yeah. So, solve that problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, I have a question around this idea of loss, and uh, which is something I, yeah, I'm not sure if I understood you like it correctly. So it made me think a little bit about Judith Butler's like conceptualization of uh, vulnerability, like what is vulnerability, and, but for her it's something ontological, right? So like this kind of condition, like for instance when she writes about loss and mourning. And like uh, she, I think for her it's also something bodily, but it like this kind of bodily vulnerability, which she, it's like a thread through many of her writings. She makes out of it an ontological condition for relationality, and I, I'm not sure whether it, I have the sense that it's different from what she means. But on the other hand, like when you, when you were referring to this Alexander Vedenai. Yeah. Is it the right name? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, you said that, um, I think the quote was that, that there are people who are so broken that they are like or lost already so much that they are ready to go to this kind of, um, like, to new relations. And I'm not sure if I might have some problems with this because for me it sounds as if it's like a set of like, okay, we need to make, is it like this, Maybe, uh, like you need to make space, like you need to get rid, it, as if it's a sum total, right? So as if you need to, to erase or uh, to get rid of something in order to then make space for something new. Is it, in a way, you reinstate the totality? Not sure about it. Yeah, I would be hesitant uh, with immediately making it then a totality or, because I think, uh, loss is a sort of a principle of absence, so mm -hmm. to say that it is a totality is a bit like, wow, that we're in the beginning of the Wissenschaft der Logik, Hegel, the sign and that's neat, uh, oh, and that changes each other, like, okay, this is not how it's meant, because I talk about bodies and ethics, so I talk about literally about existing relations, so Judith Butler talks about the vulnerability of bodies as an ontological condition, and I think, like, yeah, yeah, I mean, you can, yeah, sure. Some bodies are also more vulnerable than other bodies because they have less protection. And this is like even harder to kill than it looks. Uh, but still, it can be killed, it can be maimed. You, uh, you can be traumatized quite easily. Uh, so yeah, there is that. But this is not what uh, I mean at all. Uh, I think Butler uses that in order to have a look Mm, coming through an ethic that could be is could be seen as parallel to an ethics of care, maybe mm -hmm. caring by thinking through each other's vulnerability, and literally what I mean is the readiness to give up something, uh, the readiness to say like, no, I want to take less because we are forced in a mode of survival where self-interest is your only way to sort of like <gasps> keep it up in the world. And I talk about uh, loss in, in other work and also about generosity, just give it away, you know? Uh, and this is definitely not what Judith Butler is saying. Uh, I think Judith Butler indeed makes uh, vulnerability a totality, saying yeah. we are all yeah. vulnerable. This is not at all what I say. I say literally some people are not vulnerable. Yeah. Of yeah. course, something can happen, but you have sufficient protection, you have sufficient uh, agency power, you can be hurt when you said something, and other people have not. And this is what the Helaya also means, and not as a totality, but to say like, look, there's this moment that some people have been stripped away from, let's call it self-interest so much, uh, that they cannot participate in this mode of relation, of exploitation. Uh, and that is what the Helaya then calls via uh, Hortense Pillars. Uh, and from that nothingness, it's often the same nothingness that Fanon uh, articulates, whoop, something new needs to come because it is not. I think I haven't read the same discussion just before the talk. It is not like, I do not make the claim that you first need to take something away in order to grow something new. I say something new will always grow. This is why you have to be prepared to give it away. To accept your loss is then to say it will always grow and I have the power to take because I cannot help but take. That's basically, that is what the generative body does. It will always expand. 
there will always be new ways, even under conditions of slavery. Uh, well, what actually so clearly articulated, you have new languages, new movements, new forms of communication that stop this body from being pushed under. And it just keeps coming out. And this is what I talk about. And I think not to go too semantically, but you, you said the word get rid, and you said the word give away. So, you know, I think that's a, yeah. that's a big difference. You can get rid of, you know, like, we get rid of clothes, we give it a child your job, or we do, you know, like, if you have to go with first aid, etc. But to give away something else, you know, to give yeah. away privileges, to give away to make space. Uh, Brother Kilomba talks about that. How do you uh, make space for others to speak? Those who cannot, who doesn't have the space to speak, you know, so in that sense. So losing, but losing, and at the same time, replenishing at the same time. You don't lose it because you don't need it. But giving away certain, uh, for me, is giving away certain privileges for, to make space for others. And which is always a human relationship anyway. It, it always grew from there. There's nothing, you have, don't have to think of something new from there. Mm. Yeah. And that's why I talk about truth and practical truth and about most there, because you have to actually give up your knowing of the world. That is why it becomes unknowable, because, and that is the loss. I do not know how the world operates anymore, and yet I'm going to engage in witchcraft. I'm going to relate to that which I don't know how to relate to. And then we come to the plenum of the different ways of relating that are then possible. Because if you always know how to relate, to relate in the Western tradition, you become a colonist. We have seen how it goes. You've got a manifest destiny propelling your ass all over a continent, murdering whatever stands in your way because it's a manifest destiny. Because there's so much openness that you just start to take, 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 take. You know, and we want to get rid of that. We want to get rid of John Locke. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other questions? We've got a few minutes. I might sneak something in. So I'm still sitting on how I'm going to formulate this, but if I'm thinking about how we apply this and bring it sort of full circle to thinking about the art world, social ecology, and the art world as a domain. And I keep thinking about indifference because there's a very strong sense of loss and this discussion of getting rid of to get away. And I think an idea of indifference maybe is something that um, these two questions were sort of pointing to. If I'm thinking about how this discussion applies towards the art world, there's such a hybrid and an overlap in bodies, in institutional bodies, in logos and logic. And it was this concept of brokenness um, that the loss or the change, whatever is getting rid of, needs to somehow be mirrored or reciprocated or, or somehow acknowledged for it to be brokenness, um, might need to, maybe I've got that wrong. Um, but my my question is, how do you start that that loss or that process of giving away if there's no one on the other end to receive it? How does and in in one way I was thinking like this paradigm is really perfectly articulated in the call and response dance of giving away and that that mirroring of each other. But if you've got much more of a muddied existence or a muddy starting point, yeah, how do you sort of anchor yourself so that you can begin the process of loss and break, um, in the face of perhaps and, and forge through indifference? Yeah, I think in this uh, moment of indifference, this is also why I say that uh, in my paper, if you give loss to indifference, you just become disposable. So you need to have, you know, you need to camouflage, you need to defend yourself, you need to uh, build relations outside. So on one hand, you have to have your shields up. Yeah. Uh, whatever way, like, for instance, if I come to these spaces that are pretty exploitative, I notice that I have a perpetual anger going on to just keep it at bay, you know, because you see the exploitation coming in, or the assholery coming in, you know, so you just have to shield of anger. It's a bit like oh, tiring, but it helps. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's a question that I'm also asking myself because um, I'm also thinking about how I would like to curate other new voices, for instance, in the space, uh, in the post colonial space, and how do I do it differently, you know? And I think it's a question that, um, that by raising it, you're already, you're already curating something new, the mm -hmm. fact that you're, uh, you're building spaces or making spaces for, for, for the voices that you know, you're going to sort of hear and, and, and carry across. Um, 
Yeah, I don't have really any fixed answers, but I also think um, maybe um, uh, spaces like the Swiss Biennale already changes a lot of configurations already. You know, I mean the fact that you're actually curating something here, um, especially in the in the post-colonial context, it's always like sort of the Venice Biennale, something that just stays because it has to be there because it's been there for 120 years, etc. And even when Enrico uh, curated the, the the last one. I mean, the backlash that he had just because he wanted it to be, you know, uh, less arty in many ways. They, they described the Biennale as ugly, as morose. Yeah. It's almost like as if art has to also be. I mean, this sort of quest for happiness, and, you know, there's a, I think there's a, there's a lot of things that needs to be questioned and disrupted. And, you know. mm. Yeah, I think that's a <laughs> right, well I think that's that's that then. Thanks very much. This